Greetings, programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade Sins of the Sires. I am really glad that you guys enjoyed the first chapter of this game, and I did too. You know, the, the character creation chapter, I loved seeing how different authors go about it, and uh, this one was pretty good. So um, we are about to move on to chapter two, but speaking of character creation, wanted to let you guys know, um, I actually went ahead and restarted the story and went through the first chapter like very quickly, it took less than two minutes. And I changed up my disciplines just a little bit. Um, let me go ahead and show you here. Um, everything else we left the same, but in terms of our disciplines, we chose Auspex, Obfuscate, both of those are at three, Dominate is two, and Fortitude is one. And the reason that I did that is apparently the combination of Obfuscate and Auspex is very unique to Malkavians, and that um, ensures that you actually, that your clan becomes a Malkavian. So I really wanted to play one, and that's kind of how we've been going about it. So other than that though, everything is the same. And uh, let's go ahead and get through here at Eats Through Bars, chapter two. The world blinks back into existence and you rise. You slept right where you were on the couch. Ursa is no longer next to you. Your neck is sore now from your head lying so long in the same awkward angle. Your body feels unwieldy and grudging, like an animal you force through unfamiliar territory. Your limbs stiff, like a barely animated corpses. I like the fact that even vampires are not immune to the uh, morning creaks. You force yourself to move, shake the rigidity from your limbs, coax your quiescent blood back into some semblance of living. Instinctively, you turn towards the obscured windows. Nothing makes it through the block of cement that Marcos installed behind the closed shutters, not even a shard, but you can feel it there. The last rays of light as the sun dips below the horizon. You can hear Marcos and Persa in the kitchen. They are discussing something, their voices hushed but intense. Uninvited, you join them. Persa has her arms crossed over her chest and is turning her back on Marcos as you enter the kitchen. She's in one of her moods. She rolls her eyes when she sees you, and Marcos, who was ready to say something, closes his mouth abruptly. The conversation was clearly not meant for your ears. Still, Marcos is not the kind of man who will hold himself back in front of his inferiors. You're behaving like a brat, Persa, he says. It does not become you. His tone is final. Conversation over. What's going on? You ask. We have a job to do, Persa says, walking out. Get your stuff. We're leaving in five. You turn to Marcos for answers. What's the job? What do we need to do? You ask. I'll get to it in a minute, Marcos replies, regarding you with his blue, blue eyes. Sometimes you forget where you're... What should you call him? Not sire, surely, but... What? Boss? Father? None of it covers the deep bond that exists between you, that kind that comes from unprompted generosity and care, with all the little abuses, abuses that follow. That can follow after. So, Marcos, then. Just Marcos. Sometimes you forget Marcos came from elsewhere, his Austrian features blunted by years of blending in training and molding his facial expressions to fit the Mediterranean disposition. But here, at home, in the early dark, his blue eyes speak of foreignness, of exile, of not belonging. He changed his last name to Petru when he moved to Athens at the beginning of the 20th century, but he was Steiner before that, back in Vienna. I want to hear some more about yesterday, he says, retrieving some of his carefully stored supply of blood and decanting it into a glass. What did you make of Vol? Well, I'd rather walk out into the sun at noon than end up like him. Marcos laughs again. <laughs> Such passion, he says. He comes closer and brushes your cheek with a cold finger. Sometimes I forget how young you are. He pauses, looking at you. 
but don't let the way Vol exist or his self-imposed imprisonment fool you. He brings his glass to his lips, slowly, reverently. He closes his eyes for a moment as he sips, as something like pleasure flashes across his face. You can imagine what it tastes like. Hell, you'd drink it too, but you probably wouldn't enjoy it. Perhaps the Thin Bloods have done something to it. They do for Vol? Perhaps that's why he won't let you dig into his personal supply and instead has you fend for yourself when it comes to sourcing your own sustenance. Unless you take him at his word, of course. The one time you complained, he told you having to come up with your own supply chain builds both character and resourcefulness. In any case, you know it's not morality that stops Marcos from feeding on fresh blood. When he speaks again, his mouth is stained red. Vol commands a lot of respect in the city, still, despite appearances. Marcos pauses. If you have a friend in him, then you have a friend in a very, very high place. Good to know, you say. Anything else I should be aware of? Marcos takes another sip and thinks for a moment, swishing the blood around his mouth as if he were sampling some precious vintage. Yes, he says. He has a child, only one, because he only ever allowed himself once. Her name is Celine Ilides, and no one has heard from her in a while. She disappeared shortly after, uh, he departed. You can see her now, almost as clear if you had been there, watching her watch her sire as he walked into the sea and never looked back. A feeling rips through your chest, suffocating, drowning. And you know this is what she felt like. What abandonment feels like. Can you hear it? The beckoning? Marco's gaze flickers to the east for the briefest of moments, and you could swear his eyes grow a shade darker. No, he says. He takes another sip of blood. Not yet. A few moments pass in which neither of you speak. Then you ask, So, what's the job that Big Sis got Big Sis so worked up? Marcos nods, business face all the way on now. It's a cleanup in Exarchia, he says. A squat. Someone made a downright mess of their meal. I hear there's police presence in the area and it's likely they'll do a sweep, so you must be fast and discreet. Your mind flashes back to the first cleanup Marcos asked you to do. It was a feeding gone wrong, some neonate even younger than you taking a little bit too much a little bit too hard, then trying to fix it by turning the poor sod. It was unsanctioned, so... Um, Pisistratos wanted both of them put down. You did it quickly, while the neonate was crying tears of blood into his palms. You then had to move the bodies and clean up the blood. So much blood. Versa thinks such jobs are beneath her. Marcos continues, snapping you back to the present. Hmm. I scoff. It makes me sick too, but who does she think she is? Marcos nods again. Persephone can act spoiled, he says as if reading your mind, but you shouldn't be too hard on her. You wait for him to say why, but he doesn't. And when am I ever hard on her? You protest. You take the metro there. And Persa sulks most of the way, the fluorescent lights giving her face an even more pallid look than is normal for her. She ignores you very, very loudly. You know, we can't do this job if you won't talk to me. You prompt her. And what is there to say? She asks. It's not exactly rocket science. We go in, we determine which mouths need to be shut, and we shut them. We report anything we find out who's been about who's responsible to Marcos. That's it. Hmm. Fine. Sue yourself. She starts saying something, but then she changes her mind. 
She closes her mouth and stares at you for a few moments. When Marcos took you in, everything was new and disorienting, your body intense and unfamiliar. When you first saw Persa, you foolishly thought she would be someone to turn to, someone who had been through what you were going through and so she would understand. Help even. What a joke. All she did was ask Marcos who you belonged to and why he had to bring in a stray. She wouldn't talk to you for months. She might have never talked to you if Marcos hadn't ordered her to. And now? Now she has that earnest look in her eye. And she says, No matter what I do, he'll always be disappointed in me. You'll always be the one he pours all of his hopes into. Hmm. And you'll always be his real child. That's something I'll never have. That I can never have. Well, she says, maybe all we ever want is what we cannot have. The squad is called La Lola Rosa and has been active for over 15 years now. It's in one of the crumbling neoclassical buildings that remain among the ugly multi-story cement housing that is most of Athens. The building was first bought by a new money businessman and turned into a hotel, but then the owner played all of his new money in the new casino. The bank took possession of both the business and the building, but the previous owner's inheritors claimed it should not have been sold in the first place, presenting evidence that the building had been declared a national heritage site. Now it was then left to decay, waiting for the hulking state mechanism to kick into gear and resolve the dispute. In the meantime, the anti-fascists move in and gave the building fresh life. Now it's housing impractical dreamers with a heart for independence and a head full of one-line cliches, immigrants, and lately, refugees. More and more refugees. Unlike most squats in the area, this one had no front gate, only a gaping entrance, the door ripped from its hinges. A declaration of welcome, one supposes, an incitation of one people's anti-border mentality. That kind of na naive naivete can kill you. Not that a door could have saved them from your kind, of course. A white girl with long braided hair is lounging by the entrance. A questionable sort of guard. She st stands up as soon as she spots you. You can see the girl's first instinct is to help Persa. Your vampiric sister, so gaunt and thin she's almost transparent, always evokes a kind of sympathy or pity in mortals. She routin re uh, routinely uses that to her advantage. Aren't they helping her by feeding her, she always says, after all? Fortunately for the girl, something else inside her moves her to defend her friends, her home, and herself. Who are you? She asks, trying to look intimidating and severe. Brave little thing. A bearded man appears behind the girl. They're with me. He says. His voice is baritone and resonant, his dark eyes deep set. Oh, Jason Momoa. The entrance walls are scrawled with graffitied messages to the Aether. The humans better angels. Love is a smuggling, they read. Love is anarchy. Love is an acid that eats through bars. The girl moves aside to let you pass. You the guy? Persa asks the man as you follow him inside. The area behind the entrance is nothing but a hallway. There are signs that point in various several directions. Cooperative cafeteria to the right, living area to the left, communal kitchen at the back. Double staircases lead to the higher floors. The man extends his hand and shakes yours first, then purses. I'm Gore Kanayan, he says. Marco said you would be coming. Marcos is contact then. A vampire much older than either of you. He speaks the language fluently, but with a faint accent. Together with the last name, you can safely assume he's Arminian. Marco said you would help. He sounds both hopeful and doubtful, but you can't tell if it's because he doesn't trust the two of you, or if he doesn't entirely trust Marcos despite working with him. Both you and Persa introduce yourselves. Now, get to work. Thanks for the save, Aquaman. So, would you please show us the body? 
you ask? He winces at the word body, but doesn't comment. Instead, he turns around and heads for the stairs. Follow me, he says. He passed two floors of living quarters. One more, Gore informs you. Every centimeter of space is taken up by thin mattresses, hanging laundry, makeshift cooking areas, or people sitting on the floor reading or playing tavli. The air is spiced with cinnamon and cumin, and because most of the windows are open to the night breeze, the temperature is cool, despite the crowding. You can smell the murder scene before Gore has to say anything. The already decaying body, the coagulating blood. A young man is crouching on the floor next to the door of the room where it happened. He'd been crying, but not anymore. Someone is holding his upper arm, speaking low, comforting words at him. The soother turns to glance at you. It's the monk person you ran into yesterday, at the alley. If he recognizes you, and he might, he doesn't say anything. You enter the room. A single yellow light bulb hangs from the ceiling. The room is spare, empty except for a mattress in the corner and a tin basin filled with a pink liquid. Bloodied water. Whoever did this washed their hands when they were done. The boy is lying in the middle of the room, leg folded beneath him as if broken, his skin ashen. Blood is pooled on the sagging floor under the body, spilled, wasted. Well, nothing I haven't seen before. Maybe the sight does not leave you entirely cold. This was a boy, after all. Just a boy. But you're not going to lose your shit. You've got a job to do. The Persa comes and stands next to you, her eyebrows knitted together. Um, actually, if I went back to that, I actually redo that because I remember we have our. He would actually that would actually affect him because he has that thing against uh, harming children. Okay, I've got to remember that. The person comes and stands next to you, her eyebrows knitted together, her lips pressed into a thin line. The kind of thing usually leaves her unmoved. It's different this time. What happened? She asks, a shaking in her voice. Gore looks at the boy, then at you, his shoulders hunched. What do you think? He asks. Only what always happens. People have to sell themselves sometimes. Their blood, their sex. Some of them take our blood as payment instead of money. People never cease to confirm my idea of them. The best way not to be surprised is to expect nothing. Zero. So there are ghouls here, you ask. Gore nods. Some. A few. He gestures at the body. This one was Amphitryon's. He must have gotten bored with him. Gore rubs his eyes as if he's tired. So tired. What you'd want to do with a 15-year-old ghoul in the first place, I have no idea. Is he really so naive? You can think of a number of uses for a ghoul boy, and some of them are even comparatively innocent. But you don't pause to list any of them. There are more pressing issues to deal with. Is it... Amphitryon? I think Amphitryon. We'll, we'll go ahead and go with that. Amphitryon. You ask instead, making sure you heard the name correctly. The Seneschal? Yes, the very same. This is Strato's favorite. Or pauses, then continues. But he's not the only one. With the rumors about... Erstovoros, some kindred. You know he pronounces the word as if he were spitting. I've been getting sloppy. I don't know anything about Aristovoros. You'll tell me about that while we're taking care of all this. So, did you know the boy? Persa asks again, absentmindedly, as if she's been hardly listening to the conversation. I did, Gore says. I know everyone here. Well, let him speak. He clearly needs it. He remained silent, 
letting him speak, get things off his chest, your hands clasped in front of you. His name was Selim, Gore continues. He was a good boy. His brother is Andre. Brother, the young man outside. They came to Greece alone on a boat. Their family stayed behind. They didn't even know if they were still alive. So you took care of them, Ursa says. Gore looks at his hands, traces the lines of his palms as if reading some obscure fate there. I was not very good at it, was I? Neither of you respond to that. What are you going to do with him? Gore asks. Well, first we need to dispose of the body, you say. Then you also need to find out exactly what happened and remove any witnesses, but Gore may be too close to them to hear that right now. Disposal. Gore echoes. Sounds so... industrial. Impersonal. I'm sorry. You say, I don't like it any more than you do. So how are you going to do it? Gore asks. I know someone who can get him out of here and cremate the body on the sly. You make a few calls using a burner phone. Your guy says he's retired, but he knows someone who knows someone who can be there in 30. This is taking a bit too long for your liking, but there's nothing you can do but be there to meet the van. First, you have to move the body and clean up as much of the blood as you can. Gore is looking at the scene, obviously distressed. I'm going to continue my work in silence and just do what needs to get done. You know that if you want something done right, you should do it yourself. Persa grabs the feet, which leaves you the head. As soon as you touch the boy's hair, a vision of his last moments trickles behind your eyes. His neck bent to the right, his killer's teeth latched onto an artery. The boy is sitting in the man's lap and has his arms wrapped around the man's neck. Amphitryon has his own arms behind the boy's back, holding him tenderly as he drains him. An embrace, almost. And you know at least that the boy was not scared. Follow me, Gore says. As he leads you down the stairs to the back entrance, people disappear into rooms and corridors, pretending not to look. But you can see their faces, some angry, some grief-stricken, some plain terrified. You ignore them for now, and Gore tells you about Arist Aristovaros in a low voice that he's an elder who is said to have been influencing the politics of the region, fostering conflict after conflict for centuries. He was thought to have been beckoned, but lately the rumor has been spreading that he's coming out of the shadows to bring about a new world for Kindred, an end to the need for a masquerade itself. Some of his followers refer to him as Kronos. Some even say he's a lost antediluvian. Do you believe them? You ask. I believe people will believe in anything, if they're desperate enough, Gore replies. The van is not there yet, so you have to wait in the alley, a dead boy at your feet. Someone brings a tarp to cover him with. Small mercies. Finally, the van arrives. Everything goes quickly then. The body is loaded onto the van, and the guy asks for some money. Just to seal the deal, he says. You retrieve a 20 euro note and hand it to him. The guy nods grimly. He assures you the body will be cremated within the hour. No records, no witnesses. Not even his ashes will be left. Gore doesn't like the idea of cremation one bit. It feels wrong on so many levels, he says, to make his body disappear like that. To turn into ashes, but he understands there's nothing to be done. He surrenders to the idea. You can see it. It's always the same. The hope, the wall, the crash. So, better without. As the van speeds away, he echoes the cremations guy's last words. No ashes, no records. That's right, 
you say. It's the only way to be safe. Gore smiles sadly. As if he never existed at all. Now, time for some damage control. The brother. Maybe the priest guy, too. You turn to Gore. Who was the man I saw talking to the boy's brother earlier? His brother Isidoros, Gore says. He is, or used to be, a monk from Mount Athos. He has his own story, and that's not mine to tell, but he's been helping take care of the younger people in the squat. Teaches them Greek, and is there for them in general. Gore pauses. Doesn't seem too hung up on indoctrination, which I rather like, he adds. How much does he know? Gore thinks about it for a while. He's a man of God, he says after a while, as if that explains everything. And what does that mean? Persa asks. It means only God could ever truly know what lies in a man's heart. And a woman's? Persa asks, a little hostile. Gore holds up his hands. Only a figure of speech, Gore replies, apologetic. I'm not one of Pisistrado's misogynists, if that's what you're wondering. This is going nowhere, so you let it go, for now. Well, I should at least talk to the boy's brother, you say, bringing them back to the task at hand. Gore nods and motions you to follow him. Andre, he says, his voice low. His name is Andre. The young man is still sitting on the floor outside the room where his brother died, his arms wrapped around his knees. Brother Isidoros is no longer with him. You spot him helping a young child read a book in the adjacent corner. Andre raises his eyes to you. They're wet and bloodshot. Is it done? He asks. Is my brother at peace? Yes. Or replies, a knot audible in his throat. Did you see what happened, Andre? You ask. The young man nods. Whoa. Hey. All the way, Jay. Thank you very much for that raid. I appreciate you so much. How's your stream? Go ahead and get... Oh, Alice, thank you so much for that tier one sub. That is for 25 months. That's incredible. Remember, guys, all bit subs and ad revenue here on the channel go to help out my local children's hospital via Extra Life. So thank you for supporting the channel and supporting the kids. Animal Shelter Simulator. Cool. Got your very own pound puppies. Okay. The young man nods, tears escaping from the corner of his eyes. I saw, he says. He... I, I saw... You must do something. You can't just let him go on babbling about this. Hmm. What's our persuasion at right now? Played animal shelter sim? Helped all the lost doggos and cats find homes? Good. That is the best way to go about it. Our etiquette is at 70. Our persuasion's at 65. Persuade him not to talk to anyone about this. Yeah, no problem, Alice. You go ahead and get yourself some rest. And thank you for stopping by and for that sub. You are a slice of fried gold. Alright. You kneel in front of the young man so you're at eye level. What happened to your brother can happen again. You start. Your voice calm and reasonable. To you other people. You need our protection. But if you talk about this to anyone else, we won't be able to offer you that protection. You pause. Do you understand what I'm saying? Andre nods. Can I count on you? You ask. Yes. He replies. I won't say a word. I promise. Good. You say. Good man. The cleanup didn't go as fast as you hoped, so there's only time for one more thing before you have to leave. You look around. 
From the corners and behind sheets that count as doors, you can see children's eyes peeking out, looking at you, their faces terrified or worse, numb. And Persa has that look on her face, the one that means she's evaluating people around her by how tasty they look. Um... I should feed again soon, the game says. I'm rather ravenous myself. I need to feed. See if there's a way to join Persa. What are you thinking? You ask Persa. Her preference is drinking from her lovers during sex, which seems an unlikely prospect right now. And she will never drink from animals, but she's generally very good at adapting. She nods toward a middle-aged man sitting alone in a corner. He's thin, but looks healthy enough. And he has a look of profound sadness on his face. Persa has such a feel for always spotting the weakest in a herd. Hmm. Um, there a preference on what I eat? Only harm those who deserve it. Oh. Eh, that's not how I usually feed, but maybe he'll do just this once. We'll lower, lower our humanity. Okay, you tell Persa. She doesn't need to be told twice. She strides toward the man with an allure and confidence that clashes with her sickly appearance in a way that makes her irresistible. Hi, she tells the man. You look lonely. He follows her to a small room in the belly of the squad where no one will bother you. She doesn't ask if you want to go first. She sits in the single gutted armchair in the room and has the man sit on her lap. He realizes she's stronger than she looks, but he doesn't seem to mind. You don't know what she told him to make him choose to follow her, but he doesn't object when she bends his head to the side with more force than is necessary and bites down. The man hides his face in Persa's hair and cries softly with something that sounds like... release. When she's done, Persa turns towards you and extends her arm, an expression of calm and pleasure on her face. Come on, she says. This man is not a blood bag. It's someone living, breathing, hurting in front of you. Can you do it? It's been so long since the first and last time you did this, it'll probably leave a mark. So what do you guys think? We have the, it's okay, go for it. I can't do it, I shouldn't, but how can I say no to Persa? And I shouldn't, but the beast does not like my hunger ignored. So it looks like we have three, three yeses and one no. To tell you the truth, the fact that I only want to harm those who deserve it, I don't think that this would probably be a good... Yeah, after what he's seen, especially with the murder. I agree. Like it, it was nice to go window shopping, but we're not we're not actually going to make a make a purchase. I can't do it. Sorry, you say. I can't. This will cost you. You can't allow your hunger to become too great, because then everything you strive for, every decision you made to safeguard whatever it is you think you're safeguarding, will be for nothing. It can crumble in a moment if the beast wakes. Well, these things happen. At that moment, the sound of glass breaking rips through the squat. Oh, it's Stone Cold! Followed by the alarm screams of the residents. The entire floor fills with smoke in seconds. It's the police. You knew this was coming. But it's just a regular sweep. Or do they know about the body? Back in the main area, people around you are coughing, choking. Gore screams at them not to rub their eyes. It's tear gas. It'd only make it worse. It's the cops, he tells you, and then to the rest. To the roof! It's a good thing you don't have to breathe anymore, though the substance has an acid taste that sticks to the roof of your mouth. It stings the pores of your skin. Another can flies through one of the many windows. It hits the monk right on the head and he falls to the floor. It's an ugly wound, hard to look away from. 
but it's the smell of blood that hits you suddenly and overwhelmingly. The monk groans and covers his head with his hand, bleeding through his fingers. Ooh. Get Persa and flee, join Gore on the roof, or help the monk. I feel that if we try and help the monk, the beast will take over and we'll drain him. I don't know. Get Persa and flee. You know what? It's, uh... Live dangerously? I don't know. I think... I don't want to join Gore on the roof. I either want to... Part of me wants to help the monk. The other one wants to just get Persa and flee. We let fate decide, huh? Um, we'll do blue. We flee. Red, just because it's blood colored. Um, we'll help the monk. Red, let us help the, the dear boy out. You grab Isidoros and drag him to a corner, away from the smoke and the broken glass. There's a deep gash on his forehead, bleeding badly. It sets your teeth on edge. I am not giving the monk my blood. I will find something to help him stop the bleeding, though. You look around and find a piece of folded fabric that looks absorbent and clean enough. You steal some rubbing alcohol from someone's bedstand. Isidoro's eyes look unfocused and he idly fingers his wound, his hand shaking lightly. You push his hands away and pour the alcohol on the wound and then on the fabric, then push the fabric against it. He yelps, but you tell him to focus and apply pressure. He obeys. Why are you helping me? He asks. It's not personal. You'd have done the same. And you both know it's true. Persa appears then and grabs your arm, tearing you away. I saw some kids screaming about monsters in the squad. A dead boy. They're taking people to the station, to the hospital. Oh, uh, fuck. Persa pulls on your arm. Come on, she says. We tried your methods. Now we try mine. Oh, there we go. And that ended rather abruptly. Still, I, that, I have a feeling that that's going to cause some pretty significant ripples over the course of the story. Um, I, I think it's probably the best option that we did not give uh, the monk blood. Because, yeah, we, we would have been able to get a ghoul, which is true. Hell, we could have definitely got ourselves a ghoul but we would have gotten a uh, member of the Eastern Orthodox Church as a ghoul and we'd have to deal with true faith and potential Inquisition stuff and I just don't think that is the I don't think that's the play of course helping him out may have not have been the play either but as Kath said we're gonna live a little bit dangerously or unlive in this case all right, guys. Well, that is going to do it um, for this episode. Like I said, we're doing one episode per chapter. Um, we'll be back here soon with chapter three, The Lies We Tell. Let's go ahead and look at our stats real quick and see if anything has changed. Our humanity is still good. Hopefully we'll get an opportunity to feed again before the end of the night because um, that hunger, if the beast takes control, we're not going to be able to really control anything about our character. Um, in terms of our, we're still a cynic. We're kind of in the middle between hard and soft. Just 59% rebel and 68% self-serving. So I dig it. But we still always protect children and only harm those who deserve it. So we're still very much following our convictions. And I think that probably having our convictions um, violating those could be pretty bad for us in the long term. We also have 80 euro... 80 euros and a lock picking set. So huzzah. But um, we'll go ahead and check this out in the next stream, guys. If you haven't followed the Twitch channel, please do so. I try and stream on Tuesdays, Thursdays, the weekends with random times in between, depending on the state of my internet. And um, if you're watching the replay of this on YouTube, I have a link to the Twitch channel in the description below. A link to Vampire the Masquerade Sins of the Sires, the Steam page, if you want to have your own adventure in the world of darkness. 
and also a link to my Extra Life page where I'm raising money for my local children's hospital via the Extra Life charity. So check out all of those links if you feel so inclined. Like, share, subscribe. You guys know the drill there. And we will see you next time. Later days, everyone. <laughs>